The House Budget Committee held its first hearing on climate change since Democrats took power earlier this year. The hearing focused on the risks and costs that a warming environment poses to the U.S. economy. Here are some of the warnings presented by academics who were asked to speak at the panel. The first time that scientists formally warned a U.S. president of the risks and the dangers that climate change posed to our society was over 50 years ago, and that president was Lyndon B. Johnson. It is not, as you stated, our planet that is at risk. It is not even our species. It is our civilization. It is everything that makes our lives worth living, and it absolutely is our economy as well. We have progressed tremendously over the last 300 years, and I'm actually very grateful, personally, for the benefits fossil fuels have brought us. But just as we transition from horses and buggies to automobiles, in the same way we must now transition our energy systems into the future to ensure our continued security. I think at present we are very poorly equipped from an institutional standpoint to cope with what we might expect to see in terms of the influx of migrants, migrants coming from other countries as well as the internal displacement of Americans. I think the Dust Bowl is maybe the closest analog we have to what we might expect to see in the Midwest uh, with roughly a 25% chance. And so thinking about the movements of our own internal populations trying to cope with climate change, it is a form of adaptation and it is incredibly costly to the people who have to pick up and move their lives. Joining me now with more, Georgia Republican Congressman Rob Woodall, who sits on the House Hello. Budget Committee and also participated in those hearings. Congressman, thank you very much for joining us. I'm curious what stood out to you from today's hearing. The right, it was actually a, a very productive uh, hearing. You might not, might not be used to hearing that uh, from <laughs> Capitol Hill. Uh, but two things uh, stood out. Number one, we had Republicans and Democrats uh, saying the Green New Deal is not the pathway forward because that's not a climate proposal. Uh, that's a political agenda. Uh, but that in terms of climate, there are absolutely things that we can all agree on and all partner on today to begin making a difference uh, immediately. It was it was an encouraging uh, hearing, and I'm, I appreciate the chairman for calling it. Interesting to hear you say it was encouraging. We know that you you are you saying folks were against this Green New Deal that you've spoke to, but what it would do was it would slash carbon emissions. It would it would fund green jobs plans. So if not the Green New Deal, then what would it be? What would it be, what would it be in your book? Well, I'll give you an example. I asked the audience, it was standing room only today, uh, how many folks felt a sense of urgency about climate change. Uh, almost every hand in the room uh, went up. I also asked those folks, how do you feel that nuclear energy uh, 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 plays into that? Uh, is that carbon-free energy source a part of the solution? And again, almost every hand went up. The Green New Deal would say no. Uh, I understand that the state of Georgia gets 25 percent of its energy from nuclear uh, today, and I understand that's going to go up in the future, but we're planning to abolish all nuclear plants altogether. Uh, we've got to pick what the problem is, Raina. If the problem is energy sources we don't like, that's a different one than carbon emissions, emissions into the atmosphere. And if we're talking about carbon emissions and curtailing those, nuclear has to be on the table, hydro has to be on the table, uh, renewables uh, such as biomass have to be on the table. And he was finding that kind of agreement today, and we found a lot of it that I found very encouraging. So, Congressman, if there is one thing that you would want to push forward on climate change that you think could make a vast difference, that you could get Republicans and Democrats behind, what would that one thing be? Well, you tell, you ask me what I get people behind, uh, that's harder to manage. What I'd like to get people behind, uh, and we talked about it a little bit uh, today, uh, is uh, bringing capitalism to bear. Folks talk a lot about uh, carbon taxes. What they don't talk about is what they're going to repeal instead. Uh, there's a group called the Climate uh, Solutions uh, Caucus here on campus, a, a citizens' climate lobby that helps all across the country to, to work on those issues. And there's a proposal there that says, let's get out of the business of micromanaging some of these environmental policies and let's bring capitalism uh, to bear. Uh, that is radical uh, in its appeal uh, to both sides of the aisle. It's frightening because it's such a big idea. Can you give uh, me an I example, think... Congressman, of how capitalism could make a difference with climate change? Abs absolutely. Uh, today, uh, the EPA uh, decides that burning biomass may or may not be carbon neutral, that if you burn the limbs that fell off the tree yesterday, maybe that's carbon neutral, maybe it's not, because we asked the EPA to make those decisions. What if we didn't? What if you put a, a price on carbon and let the marketplace figure that out? What if those folks who were able to do more did more, those industries that can't do more were able to buy the 
those credits. We've seen that kind of cap and trade program go on in the uh, hard air chemicals. The Clean Air Act of 1990 did that with NOx and SOx. Um, but the question isn't, do we need a new carbon tax? That's what the Green New Deal asks for. The question is, what can we replace in a burdensome government infrastructure today with capitalistic incentives uh, tomorrow? Again, it's a, it's a radical uh, conversation. It's going to make folks uncomfortable on both sides of the aisle. But if you and I were going to try to make a big difference for the next generation, I think that's the conversation we'd have. All right, Congressman, we know later today the House is expected to vote on whether to hold Attorney General William Barr and former White House counsel Don McGahn in contempt for not complying with subpoenas. How will you vote on this measure? They, I'm really disappointed that we're having uh, those conversations in the Judiciary Committee, uh, Rain. In fact, right now we're debating on the floor of the House whether the Judiciary Committee chairman ought to be able uh, to uh, go to court on the, on the Congress's uh, behalf. Uh, I hope that we will not pass that measure either. Uh, when uh, I was on the other side of this issue, uh, holding Attorney uh, General Eric Holder in contempt for not providing Congress with documentation, we worked for over a year and a half to try to find an agreement. Uh, just yesterday, uh, the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, uh, Democrat uh, Jerry Nadler, uh, said that he believed if we could keep the agreement that he reached yesterday, that additional legal action wouldn't even be necessary. I believe in Article I. I believe that we have an oversight responsibility. Uh, but going immediately uh, to the courts, going immediately uh, to that us against them uh, strategy, I think feeds political uh, goals more than it feeds policy goals. You mentioned political goals and you also mentioned oversight. My understanding was in an interview with MSNBC, you said that you haven't read the Mueller report. Why is that? The, well, we were talking primarily about volume two. You know, volume two uh, says after we've done 200 pages of research in, in volume one, to say absolutely no conspiracy took place between the Trump administration and, and uh, the Russian government, then volume two goes to all the efforts they believe might have been involved in trying to cover up the crime that never existed uh, to begin with. Uh, I'm, I'm disappointed uh, that in this political environment, uh, that we, the answer to the question, nothing uh, uh, happened. The, the faith of the American people in, in who we are, that we stand together, that the Russian government has no influence in what we do, uh, that was the conclusion of volume uh, one. That's where we ought to be spending our time. Well, there was uh, a the sense, crime. sir, just, just to be clear here, there was a sense that there was, our intelligence community said that there was meddling, uh, influence from Russian, oh. Russian folks. I mean, that is just, you can't deny that. If you had you a chance to speak directly and talk to Robert Mueller, what would you ask him? The, I, don't, I don't have any questions for Mr. Mueller. He was assigned a job, and I think he did that job as, as well as he could. I want to go back to what you said, uh, which is the Russians did try to meddle. They just didn't meddle with the partnership of the Trump administration. The Russians did try to meddle, and we should hold every single one of those folks accountable. The Russians absolutely tried to meddle, and yet half of the Mueller report is focused on the Trump administration and what the Trump administration was doing after this counterintelligence investigation started. Uh, we should Sir, be concerned. Sir, what would concerned. you do, Congressman Woodup? What would you do? Because this is really a legitimate, serious issue going into 2020. As a member of Congress, how do you prevent the Russians from doing this again or making it very difficult for any other state or non-state entity? The, that is a serious issue, Raina. And, and the more we localize elections, the more social media plays a role, the harder it is to keep those state actors out. The Mueller report detailed how the Russians got started years ago, how they built up their uh, influence uh, through all of the social media uh, platforms available to them. How do we stop that and still protect the freedoms that every American enjoys? The fact of the matter is, it has always been easier to infiltrate America than any other totalitarian regime on the planet because in America, freedom allows that. Totalitarian regimes don't. Uh, should we be focused on it? Can we do more in terms of election security? Of course we can. Can we stop it from happening in a free society? We can't. We just have to continue policing against it. And I reject the notion uh, that this is driven uh, by the left or by the right. Uh, foreign powers uh, are something that we unite as Republicans and Democrats to stand against. Congressman, you come from the good state of Georgia. I've got to ask you, a consortium of more than 180 CEOs signed a letter calling abortion restrictions such as uh, Georgia's, and I'm quoting here, bad for business. You've been critical of the movie companies threatening to leave your state. 
What's your response to these executives, and what will you do if your state loses massive money in business? Well, when you're fighting for life, it's not about money, uh, Raina, and I think that's number one. Uh, if uh, the tool you want to use to express your political opinion is, is economic boycotts, you're welcome to use that tool, but, but watch what's happening with the left uh, today. When someone disagrees with them, that's what they do. They go after their livelihood. They go after their reputation. They go after their career. Uh, we believe in life uh, in Georgia, and we're proud that we believe in life uh, in Georgia. Uh, I would point you to those movie studios that have said, listen, Georgia is the absolute best place in the country to do business. Uh, we do more film production in Georgia than in California. Uh, and so we're going to stay in Georgia. We're going to keep doing great work in Georgia, and we'll contribute money to the other side of the political issue for folks uh, who don't think Georgia's found the right uh, space. Again, if the worst thing that's happening in Georgia is that we're fighting too hard for life, I think those are good problems to have. Congressman, I, my understanding is you are not running, seeking re-election in 2020 uh, when your time is up. I want to ask you, is there any issue, anything, that you think you could get folks both in the Democratic and Republican Party to move on? Oh, golly, Raina, the, the list is long. I, I can believe you give, that can this you give president... Me two, can you give me two Absol things that you can get people to move on in Congress? Immigration reform and transportation infrastructure development. Really? Th this president Why? wants to put his signature on the bill that brings a sanity to America's immigration policy for another generation. I, I represent a majority-minority district, uh, Raina. About 26 percent of my bosses are first-generation Americans. The future of the Republican Party lies in first-generation Americans. It lies in robust immigration where people but come you to mentioned, America. You mentioned immigration, sir. What exactly right. would that plan look like that you think could get oh, sure. both parties to move on? The, we all agree there's a humanitarian crisis on the border, so we have to fund uh, that. We all agree that there's a magnet to come here illegally instead of legally. We can address that. I, I bring people together, Raina, by pairing a robust legal immigration system with repairs to the illegal uh, immigration that's going on today. Remember, the president said in his State of the Union address he wanted to preside over the highest level of legal immigration America has ever seen. I want to take yes for an answer. Let's do that together while we have a president who put his signature on it. All right, and transportation Con infrastructure is the other. And a lot of Americans would tell you they would love to see some tra transportation right. infrastructure efforts. We'd love to have you back, Congressman. I'm afraid we're out of time. We'd love to check back in with you to see if you're able to move on those two issues. Georgia Representative Robert Woodall, thank you for joining us, Congressman. Thank you, Raina. You bet.